Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev has taken on the Trudeau government over the issue of drug decriminalization after British Columbia said they want to at least partially reverse course. Now to discuss this in more detail is political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly who joins us once again from the big smoke. Brian, what's the reaction of the Trudeau government? Could the Liberals reverse course or maybe double down on some of these drugs? My worry is that they're going to double down and even expand this to Toronto. So British Columbia put in an application to Health Canada in 2022 asking for a full decriminalization of all hard drugs. So uh, methamphetamines, fentanyl, crack, cocaine, heroin, didn't matter. You could do these drugs. You could have, I believe it's up to two and a half grams for personal use. You could not be charged. Now, for the most part, police aren't charging individuals with simple possession anymore, even for hard drugs, not just, you know, they long ago gave up uh, charging people for simple possession on marijuana, even before it was legalized. They've also given up on uh, charging people for simple possession of harder drugs. But by decriminalizing it, what you ended up having uh, happen was that people were openly using their crack pipe or shooting uh, opioids into their arms in children's play parks on uh, public transit, on the SkyTrain, on street corners, and police could not do anything about it. It was legal. And this led to all kinds of mayhem, and this is what British Columbia wants to roll back. Remember, it's an NDP government in British Columbia, and they asked the Trudeau government, hey, can we fix this? They don't want to go back to a full recriminalization of these hard drugs. What they're asking for is that it be criminalized again in everywhere but, uh, for example, homes or shelters, um, safe consumption sites, as they're called, those sorts of places. And the Trudeau government won't even commit to that. They've been asked multiple times since this became an issue, and they won't commit. You can be sure that the, uh, the, the government of Premier David Eby raised this with them before he went public. He didn't just come out on a Friday afternoon and say, hey, we need this. He'd been asking for this ahead of time. The Trudeau government was unresponsive. Uh, Mental Health and Addictions Minister Yara Sachs, who's a Toronto MP, you'll find out why that's important in a, in, in a moment. Uh, she was asked about this and said, well, we're, we're one year into a three-year pilot project and we're still evaluating. Now, why is the fact that Sachs is a Toronto MP important? Because Toronto has a similar proposal before Health Canada that would say it's only illegal to use these hard drugs inside childcare centers, K-12 schools, and airports. Meaning you're at the park pushing your kid on a swing, somebody wants to sit down next to you and smoke their crack pipe, that's completely legal. Police cannot do anything about it. That has people worried, or at least it has regular people worried, but the Trudeau Liberals have said, we're still reviewing the application. Toronto Mayor Olivia Chow, long affiliated with the NDP, still supports it. The public health officers support it. And Hal, I don't know why, because when you look at the numbers, what do they tell us this is for? This is to reduce the number of overdose deaths? It hasn't happened. In fact, last year in British Columbia, it was a record year, up 161 to 2,546 over drug overdose, uh, overdose deaths last year. That's not, not a success story. Yeah, so Brian, how would this actually work in a city like Toronto? I mean, Ontario Premier Doug Ford has said repeatedly he rejects drug decriminalization. But as you mentioned, Olivia Chow, NDP mayor and local Liberal MPs support it. So how would it work if drugs are legal on one side of the street but not on the other? Well, that's an important point because, you know, this is a metropolis area. You don't have, a, you know, a no man's land between Toronto and Mississauga or Toronto and... Uh, Pickering or uh, York region to the north, you cross the street and you're in a different jurisdiction. This is going to be chaos. It's going to have an impact on these areas that have not asked for this. And you know, we've talked about this before. I think it was just last week we talked about the importance of provincial and federal jurisdiction and government staying within their lanes. Well, if a province is going to say no to something, the federal government should listen to that province. But Justin Trudeau uh, he's been asked about all the areas he's invading provincial jurisdiction, which is annoying. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith, it's annoying. Quebec Premier uh, Francois Legault, it is, you know, a real problem. But Trudeau just sees himself as he can do whatever he wants in whatever jurisdiction. And so Doug Ford says, no, we don't want this here. But 
all but one MP in Toronto is a Liberal, and the mayor is NDP, and she wants this. They're still pushing for it. So there's a good chance that we could see all kinds of chaos as a result of this. Brian, federal conservative leader Pierre Polyev says he'll be use the notwithstanding clause to lock up dangerous criminals regardless of what the courts say. Let me ask you something. Is this the best approach? Should he become prime minister? I think it's becoming an approach that he has to take because our courts are increasingly going well beyond areas that they should. Um, you know, I can point to... Um, the case in Alberta, I'd, I'd have to look it up again. I think it may have even been in your town of Lethbridge, where a, a guy was charged with uh, pointing a firearm, discharging a firearm. He shot up a house and they used, he was charged and there should have been a mandatory minimum, but they used a hypothetical case. They didn't use the case before them. They used a hypothetical to say, no, this is unconstitutional. And therefore, the mandatory minimum against this man is unconstitutional. They've done that with child luring. They've done that with sexual assault. In cases like the uh, labor law, you know, I, I got an email today saying all these civil servants are going on strike. Why can't we just, well, make them essential services? You can't based on the Supreme Court, which, by the way, spent 60 years going in one direction and then with one ruling by an activist judge said it's time to say that the right to strike is a charter protected right which the framers of the constitution and the charter said it wasn't which the courts had said for years that it wasn't and now it is and so the courts are increasingly going beyond their realm and they are legislating from the bench in ways that even within a common law system which is what we have in all areas of the country except Quebec, it goes beyond what we would expect. And so the politicians have to do something if they're going to have any control left. Otherwise, we're no longer being ruled by elected officials that we can throw out. We're being ruled by appointed judges that we can't do anything about. And so Paul Yev, in a, uh, a speech to the Canadian Police Association, said he's going to get tough on crime again, including for multiple murderers, and he will use the notwithstanding clause if he has to, and voters can decide if they support that or if they don't. You know, I, I'd love to see an election where Justin Trudeau says, no, I stand with murderers getting better treatment in jail than their victims. I, I don't see that going over very well. You know, Brian, it was just over a year ago that Pierre Polyev said everything in Canada is broken. He mentioned the same thing to us here at Bridge City News. Now the Liberals said, no, no, that's not broken. Everything's, everything's fine here. I mean, we have some struggles and challenges, but, you know, Canada's doing very well here. But are the Liberals not doing the same thing right now as they cross the country to sell their budget that's based on class and generational warfare? They really are. And you listen to um, Deputy uh, Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christy Freeland talk about how things aren't working as they should. Uh, Justin Trudeau says the system's not um, you know, living up to the promise that it was, they are effectively saying the system's broken. Uh, that's what Pierre Polyev was saying. They sound just like him now, but they're trying to put a softer sell on it, perhaps. Uh, look, this the system isn't working. The fact is, your kids can't buy a house. My kids can't buy a house. Um, and it's not like, well, they can't buy a house this year because they're 25. It's they can't buy a house now. And there's no hope for them to be able to buy a house unless mom and dad pony up a ton of money that they probably don't have for most families. And, you know, things like that, that is what is broken. Or, you know, it, you know, you look at all the areas where the Trudeau liberals have broken down the system. They're busy running around the country, Hal, trying to uh, promise you everything, you know, including the kitchen sink and maybe a pony for your backyard but they're not looking after the basics that we want in our system. They're not looking after the things that they're actually responsible for. And so, yes, the country is falling apart in many ways. And I remember when Polyev first said, Can uh, everything in Canada seems broken. People said, oh, we should say Ottawa's broken or the politics are broken. He's, you know, he just stuck with it and said, no, it seems like everything's broken. Things aren't working as they should. And that's now the liberal message as well. So let me ask you, is the budget selling any better two weeks after it was released? I mean, another week and another poll showing support for the Trudeau Liberals keeps sliding. 
The latest poll is Nanos, which uh, liberals have, you know, long pointed to and said, oh, Nanos has us closer. Yeah, it's only 12 points or it's only 15 points. Well, now it's 20 points with Nanos. Uh, the latest Nanos national numbers have the conservatives at 44 percent nationally, the liberals at 24. Um, this is this is the, the budget has offered them no bump. Whether it was the abacus poll that was released on the day of the budget while the lockup was still going on, and it showed that despite two weeks of a cross-country tour, things were not better. I believe that was a 20-point gap. You had Ipsos with a 19-point gap, Angus Reid with a 20-point gap, uh, now Nanos with a 20-point gap. Yeah, sure, you've got Frank Graves from Eco saying, oh, no, it's much closer, but... Uh, there's a lot of reasons that people like myself don't put stock in Frank Bray's polls based on his past statements. So, you know, the, the ton of pollsters all saying it's an 18, 19, 20 point gap. That's difficult to overcome unless you've got some big change. The liberals hoped the budget was going to be the big change. Uh, when Ipsos did their poll on this, they broke it down by generation and whether it was Gen Z, millennials, what have you overwhelmingly, they were all voting conservative um, over the liberals. This was a budget aimed at getting Gen Z and millennials back on board, and it's not happening. And, you know, their best group is still women over the age of 60, and they're not even leading with them. Now, you recently wrote an article published across the country detailing how the Trudeau government has failed to deliver, Brian. Now, one area you looked at specifically was the dental program. But let me ask you something. How is not delivering dental, especially for Canadian seniors, a good thing? Well, if you're going to design a program to deliver dental care, you might want to talk to dentists before launching it. And the Trudeau government didn't. So they built this program and they signed up. The last number I heard how was 1.6 million seniors. And a lot of them, women over the age of 60, that core group for the liberals. And now they're not delivering. And this is a theme I keep coming back to. Whether it's housing, whether it's you know the gun ban and the so-called gun buyback program, that's not delivering on that. They're not delivering on housing and on dental. They promised a dental care program. First off, they're making it sound like it's free. It's not. There's a copay that depends on your income. The government's not talking about that. They're just making it sound like, oh, hell, go to the dentist. It'll be free for you. Well, okay, that's going to be your first disappointment. Then you're going to go to your dentist and find out that for the most part, your dentist probably has not signed up for it because the majority of dentists are saying no to this. The Canadian Dental Association is not opposed to this program. They're not fighting it, but they're fighting the program design and saying, the way you've designed this program doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for patients. You got to fix it. There are currently private dental programs that work. There are public ones. Alberta has one. Ontario has one. BC has every province has a dental program. Do you think the federal government spoke to the dentists or the private sector insurance companies or the provinces before launching their program? No. I mean, the, the easiest thing for them to have done would have been to gone, uh, go to uh, Alberta Premier Danielle Smith and Ontario Premier Doug Ford and all the others and say, you've got a dental program for low-income people in your province. We want to help seniors. How can we work with you to deliver dental care for seniors without dental care? Who, who would be against that? You know, that's like saying, I, I hate kids and I hate motherhood and apple pie. You know, nobody's going to stand up and scream about that. But the dentists say, this is a bureaucratic program that, you know, it's not even about the money. It's about the bureaucracy. It's going to take up so much of their time. It's not going to deliver the services that people are expecting. And it's not worth the effort. Brian, campus rallies in support of the Palestinian people continue in the United States. We've seen what's unfolded at Columbia University in New York and what's happened in BC at many of our post-secondaries here in Canada. Will we see even more of these continue here in our nation? Well, if university officials and provincial governments don't step in, then yes. Um, McGill is already overtaken. Uh, UBC is on its way. The University of Ottawa, it just started yesterday, but it doesn't look good. Here, uh, you know, just steps from where I'm sitting is the University of Toronto. They've just done a big campus redevelopment program, a lot of new infrastructure going into the heart of their campus, a new underground parking garage, replacing the piping and all of this. And on top of that is this big common green area 
Well, they had to close that down the other day. Uh, they put up fencing around it and they put up posters saying this area is closed. It was a preemptive measure because they were informed. They found out that there was going to be an attempt to put in a big encampment like we've seen at Columbia. And I don't know if you've seen the latest out of Columbia, but they've overtaken administrative buildings. They have broken into buildings. It is complete vandalism and chaos. At USC in Los Angeles, they've had to cancel graduation programs. That shouldn't be happening. So far, the only university I can point to and say kudos to you is U of T. I'm not close enough to the ones out uh, your way, but you know we're seeing some weak responses in the United States and a few weak responses here in Canada. We can't allow that to happen. The university has to be safe for all students. You can't have people saying this is this is an area where we're not going to allow Jewish students or Jewish professors. And if you're not on board with us, we're going to stop you. That's what we've seen in uh, Montreal. It's what we've seen in the United States. It can't be allowed to happen. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for joining us today from Toronto. Thank you, Hal.